<laughs> returning for our post uh, lunch session. Uh, so we'll get everyone settled here. Um, just a little announcement about um, how we are adapting or adaptable to our hybrid and streaming uh, fun that we've had. Um, please uh, just view our helper here, Mark, as the theater backstage hand, who is going to be uh, running around and uh, helping us start our presentations. We're very grateful uh, for him for bearing with us and, and, and being so patient. Thank you. So um, there may, what this means is that just in between as we're setting up presentations, you may notice just a brief lag. So we'll just be um, patient with that. I was thinking, I was trying to think of a technology in which this could be related to historically. And I was thinking of the telephone operator girls who would plug in, you'd call and they would <laughs> plug in. So that's maybe what we're doing here. Um, so I'm really just so pleased to start our next session. Uh, we are very fortunate to have the First Ladies Association for Research and Education, or FLAIR, uh, who will be here presenting on the documentary legacy of First Ladies, Location and Access. And I'll remind us of this again, but they're also sponsoring our upcoming coffee break. So we're really grateful to have them and um, thankful for uh, the upcoming treats that we'll be having with them. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy Keegan-Smith, who is going to introduce the panel. make sure that it is off. <laughs> um, I'm Vice President of the First Ladies Association for Research and Education. Our president, Myra Guten, is right there in the pink. You can uh, visit with us at, at the coffee break. I started at my career at the Johnson Library in August of 1973, which was about a year and a half after my colleague Claudia Anderson had started. And we both had the privilege of uh, being archivists who worked with Mrs. Johnson processing different components of her papers. And in doing that, had the great privilege of getting to know a wonderful first lady. Um, in, 19, in 1989, I co-edited and compiled Modern First Ladies, their documentary legacy, which was put out by the National Archives. And it is still to this day, although out of date, the only uh, repository wide guide on First Ladies papers. I moved to Washington in 1989 and became director of the Presidential Materials Division, which is the division at the National Archives and Records Administration that deals with presidents, first ladies, advises on records issues as they want that advice, deals with <laughs> national security and the presidential moves. So behind the scenes, uh, I've been getting a lot of questions recently. I retired, <laughs> fortunately, in uh, the first term of Obama in December of 2012. In retirement, I'm in the finishing stages of a college textbook, which also will be available as a trade book. Very exciting development for those of you who care about First Ladies. It's with Cognella Press. It's with Dr. Diana Carlin and Anita McBride. And it is the first college textbook ever on First Ladies. It's interdisciplinarian. And then it will be issued in a trade book. So that will be coming out in the fall. I am pleased to introduce our uh, panel. And I'm going to try my technical skills and see if the slide moves, which it doesn't. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so let's. Oh, sorry. Patience was never one of my virtues. <laughs> but I'm very thankful for Mark's confidence.
Okay. So now I push. Ah, introduction to the panelists. We have a wonderful panelist, Miriam Liebman, who is on my far right, is assistant editor of the Adams Papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society and has written on uh, Louisa Adams and works on both Louisa and Abigail. Claudia Wilson Anderson, a longtime friend and archival colleague at the LBJ Library. She retired as supervisory archivist. And although she retired, she continues to work on contract with the LBJ Foundation. And then Catherine Cady Sibley, who I have also known for a long, long time, is professor of history and director of American studies at St. Joseph's University. And Katie has a very wide range of specialties from espionage in the United <laughs> States by the Soviets to first ladies. She's edited two college, two textbooks on first ladies, and she's currently working on a book on Michelle Obama. So um, they are, it is a wonderful panel. And uh, the panel presentation will include my, I will try and make it not too boring, my summary of the location, access, and current state of digitization of First Ladies Papers, because I know that y'all are interested in that, and it's very uneven. It's not like with presidents, you know. Uh, as I will say, as Abigail Adams said, you know, in, in digitization, we need to remember the first ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Miriam's presentation is on digitization projects of Abigail and Louisa Adams papers and Massachusetts Historical Society has been a real leader in digitization. And Claudia's presentation is on Lady Bird Johnson's digitized materials, including the White House Diary, which has been getting huge play recently. And Hulu has a film coming out on, in the fall based on uh, the diaries. It's just fantastic, uh, edited by Don Porter. And then Katie is going to be a view from a scholar and a researcher on the challenges is access and availability of recent First Ladies papers. And so my talk will get a little in the weeds. For me, it's gonna try not to get too much in the weeds, but what I'm trying to explain is why these papers just can't be thrown up on the internet or online immediately. Although we would love that. <laughs> First Ladies, uh, their achievements and legacies, Although the role of first lady has really been around since 1789, it has taken a long time for scholars and the public to acknowledge the importance of first lady separately from her husband. Part of that is because a lot of the historians and scholars were men and they didn't see first ladies as that important. There was a real breakthrough with Dr. Lewis Gould at the University of Texas when in uh, 19, 88, he did the first college textbook on Lady Bird Johnson and the environment. And it's very interesting in his preface, he said at the time he had all these male colleagues asking him if he didn't think he was doing a trivial topic. Uh, to which he responded, I think Lady Bird Johnson's efforts in the environment were just as important as many men so I'm interested as to why you think that's a trivial topic. But you could see sort of the mentality. In 1984, at the Gerald R. Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, Betty Ford convened the first ever conference on First Ladies with Rosalind Carter, where they both agreed that the modern First Lady has become an independent public spokesperson and an independent figure in her own right. Since there, that time, there has been increasing interest in First Ladies and their important contributions and unique positions. A 2021 professional association was formed to facilitate uh, inter networking, intercommunication programs, and it's called the First Ladies Association for Research and Education, FLAIR, which is sponsoring this panel and all panelists are FLAIR members. The panel will focus on location, access, and availability to these records, 
and we're going to try hard to uh, leave a lot of time for questions. Some practices of first ladies. We're pretty lucky that some of these practices weren't followed by all first ladies. But Martha burned almost all her love letters to George. There's like one left. And others followed, Julia, Edith, and even Bess. And there's a story about Bess. And you know, sometimes in history, these stories take on their own. Uh, they become either enlarged, but the story is that when they moved back to their home in Independence, Missouri, uh, President Truman came down one day and Bess was at the fireplace throwing in letters. And Harry asked in heart, Bess, what are you doing? And she said, I'm burning our love letters. And he said, think of history. And she said, that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> so she did, in fact, burn most of their love letters. However, Abigail, Dolly, and most other first ladies saved their papers along with their husband's presidential materials. Brief history of presidential papers. And this is very brief for me, okay? Because this, <laughs> this was my meat and potatoes. But why am I doing this? I'm trying to give you a feeling of what all has to uh, go before that first lady's digitized document appears online. Presidential papers from George Washington through Jimmy Carter, including those of the first lady, but excluding the category of one, Richard Nixon, are donated historical materials. So from the start of our country until President Carter, the president's papers were considered his private party. George Washington left Mount Vernon with several truckloads of papers. And uh, Madison, Jefferson, many of the early presidents started selling them to the Library of Congress. Hence, the Library of Congress became the place where most earlier presidential papers are, except for uh, exceptions like the Massachusetts Historical Society. Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the federal presidential library system with the archives in 1939. It was codified into the Presidential Libraries Act of 1955. President Nixon's papers, including Pat, were seized by the government and are covered under a unique statue of one, the Presidential Recordings and Materials Preservation Act. Why were they seized? President Nixon made an agreement with the head of GSA at the time, which the archives was under for stated, stated destruction of tapes and papers. And that had never happened before. Because of the public outcry over the status of the Nixon papers, and I was in the archives at the time as was Claudia, and all these people are going, well, why aren't these papers public instead of private? Congress passed the Presidential Records Act in 1978. Sort of interesting, the commission was set up to study the records of all three branches of government. And the commission advised that the records of senators and congressmen, justices of the courts, and the president all be under some federal law. But the only one, the only recommendation that was meant to be feasible was the one on the president. Congress didn't want to make its papers uh, public. <laughs> so from Congress forward, official presidential and first lady records are covered under the Presidential Records Act and are, not pub are public, not private. But all of these acts require review on a page by page basis. So before you see them on the internet, there's been some review for information like clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. And yes, there is unmarked national security in First Lady's papers. Hmm. I like what Betty Ford said about First Lady's papers. She said, if the West Wing is the mind of the nation, then the East Wing is the heart. And what she meant by these is what is unique about First Lady's papers and why I encourage each one of you, many of you have looked at presidential digitized collections. Well, the First Lady's collections give you something else. They give you a more human touch, a more personal touch, even in the official. 
and they give you a, a different read. So I really think that they are extremely important. Uh, official records, what are they? They're official records documenting ceremonial duties and events and her uh, role as surrogate for the president, planning for head of state and other events, has her correspondence schedules, press releases, speeches, extensive photo and audio visual files and tapes, documentation of her main projects dealing with the media, and the older libraries and many of the newer have donated personal files, often which have love letters between the president and the first lady's personal diaries, posts, and pre-presidential files. I will say, I, I uh, in your fourth or fifth bill, bullet, I say tapes, okay? Uh, presidential tape recordings essentially ended with Nixon. <laughs> so I've been asked this by many reporters and there isn't any official taping going on in the White House anymore. Uh, but I mentioned tapes because there are some very good tapes of Mrs. Johnson, of Jackie Kennedy. Um, and so there's, and uh, also uh, Laura Bush did the face, first radio broadcast. Eleanor Roosevelt did a series of broadcasts and television series, those will be available at the library. And then Lou Henry Hoover did the first radio address. So tapes, audio, visual. But when I say tapes, people go, oh, well, what happened to the Trump tapes? And I go, hmm. Huh. <laughs> um, uh, so let's go on. The PRA and the First Lady's records, if I see you glazing over, I'll try and be shorter and sweeter. While the act does not specifically mention the first lady by name, it does state in its definition that presidential records include any records documenting the president and his staff in their carrying out of constitutional, statutory, official, or ceremonial duties. So the Reagan papers were the first papers. I was in my job at the archives and meeting with all these lawyers at the end of my career. I hardly ever saw an archivist. Um, and well, they're all sitting around going, Miss Smith, do you think the Presidential Records Act applies to the First Lady? Doesn't mention her. And I go, yeah, I, I think so. And they go, well, we all think so too. And so from Reagan forward, that uh, all official records of the First Lady are covered under the act. And when I used to, I used to fly out to the Reagan Library to help because the Reagans would get upset that these weren't their papers and the library staff might make a mistake in the way they were dealing with them. Ms. Reagan would go, now Nancy, we're dealing with those papers that should be ours, but are yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she was very easy to do. <laughs> the act requires separation of personal papers from presidential records. Many people don't understand. There's a key case, Nixon v. Administrator, Political papers are not record papers because the president can be head of his political party. The Supreme Court ruled that's covered by the First Amendment, freedom of speech and association, and private. So a diary of a first lady, even if it mentions things like Vietnam and everything, that doesn't convert the record status from a personal diary to a record diary. What would is how that diary was used. The Presidential Records Act sets up a complicated uh, system of processing. And uh, fortunately for everyone here, I'm not going to go into it too much, but uh, it has six presidential restrictions lasting for 12 years. One that closes a whole lot of information is confidential advice between the president and his advisors. And eight of the nine Freedom of Information Act, uh, except. Uh, exemptions. Um, for the first five years, the records are not available to public requests, only special access requests. So Melania and Trump and Donald Trump's records are not available to public access. Courts of competent jurisdiction, the incumbent president, former president, and ongoing business of Congress. And the, the records become subject to FOIA requests 
to the public five years after the president leaves office. If you want to see something, my best advice to first ladies researchers, which I just gave to Katie yesterday, is you can't say you want to see all of Laura Bush's files. Okay. It will put you at the end of a long queue. You have to say, I would like to see Laura Bush's trip files when she went to Burma. You need to make small and specific requests, and you need to work with the library archivists who will really help you phrase those requests. Then they go in a shorter queue and get reviewed more quickly. And the PRA, like all the other statutes, requires a line-by-line -line review before opening. Examples of digitized First Lady's papers. Now it gets a little bit. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> Examples of digitized first lace papers. Abigail Adams and Miriam's going to probably be upset that I made it so tiny, but I love the letter, remember, remember the ladies. If it was done before she was first lady, if you haven't read the whole letter, go to Adams online and read the whole letter because people always take the line, remember the ladies, but she gets a lot more specific mm -hmm. about how men are tyrants and women <laughs> should rule the world. And it is extremely interesting letter and you could do a whole thing on it. Um, and then I have a copy of Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, resigning uh, from the Daughters of the American Revolution because they wouldn't permit Marian Anderson to sing at Constitution Hall. But the best audio visual, which will make you cry, is if y'all can get a hold of the Marian Anderson singing at the Lincoln uh, Memorial. 70,000 people came. Many people don't know it. It was the biggest event before the I Dream speech. And it is so heartening. OK, so. I'm giving you, often editors don't think of the audio visual uh, or audio materials, and they're very good. And you feel like a fly on the wall in a way you don't when you're reading a dry to old document. So this first one is Jackie Kennedy thanking President Johnson for a letter he wrote. You're gonna have to listen well, but we'll see how this plays here. Maybe click on the arrow when you pops up. Okay, Mark. <laughs> uh, oh, I see. I yeah, think. Okay, but I'll let you do it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Mrs. Kennedy, 2191. Mr. President? I just wanted you to know you were loved and by so many and so much. Oh, Mr. I'm President, one of them. I tried. I didn't dare bother you again, but I got Kenny O'Donnell over here to give you a message. If he ever saw you, did he give it to you yet? No. About my letter no. that, that was waiting for me last night. Listen, sweetie, now, first thing you got to learn, you got some things to learn, and one of them is that you don't bother me. You give me strength. But I wasn't going to send you in one more letter. I was Don't just scared you'd anything. answer. Don't send me anything. You just come over and put your arm around me. That's all you do. <laughs> when you haven't got anything else to do, let's take a walk. Let's walk around the backyard. And uh, oh. just let me, let me tell you how much you mean to all of us and how we can carry on if you give us a little strength. But you know what I want to say to you about that letter? I know how rare a letter is in a president's handwriting. Do you know that I've got more in your handwriting than I do in Jack's now? No, what, well. And for you to write it at this time and then to send me that thing today of, you know, your tape announcement and everything. I want you to just know this, that I told my mama a long time ago, when everybody else gave up about my election in 48, yeah. my mother and my wife and my sisters and you females got a lot of courage that we men don't have. And so we have to rely on you and depend on you, and you've got something to do. Uh, you've got the president relying on you, and this is not the first thing you had. So 
So there are not many women, you know, run around with a good many presents. So you just, uh, you just <laughs> bear that in mind. You got the biggest job of your life. He ran around with two presidents. That's what they'll say about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anytime. Well, goodbye, darling. Thank you for Bye. calling, Mr. President. Bye, goodbye. Sweetie. Do come back. I will. I think that that tells you so much. First of all, I don't know if you picked up, but she's crying when she says, you know, I have one more in your hand than I do in Jack's. Yeah. You cannot read that in a textual document. And uh, the other thing when I'm plighted is the regional differences. I plighted at the Miller Center at UVA, and they said, oh, Lyndon Johnson's awful. He was putting the make on uh, labor. <laughs> and I go, why would you say that? And he said, well, he wanted to put his arm around her. And I go, well, I grew up uh, a lot of my life in the South. And that's a very normal expression. He was just being affectionate. Now I'm going to be playing Laura Bush, uh, Barbara Bush's speech at Wellesley, which amazingly is in the top 100 speeches of all time. So let's uh, quick thing. Okay, thank you, Mark. You're an angel. <laughs> Wellesley did not want her. They thought she was too provincial, too uh, not feminist enough, and they wanted Alice Walker, but Barbara Bush came in and wowed them. Okay? So, Okay. Now I know your first choice today was Alice Walker. <laughs> Guess how I know. <laughs> Known for the color purple, instead you got me known for the color of my hair. <laughs> and as you set off from Wellesley, I hope that many of you will consider making three very special choices. The first is to believe in something larger than yourself, to get involved in some of the big ideas of our time. I chose literacy because I honestly believe that if more people could read, write, and comprehend, we would be that much closer to solving so many of the problems that plague our nation and our society. And early on, I made another choice, which I hope you'll make as well. Whether you're talking about education, career, or service, you're talking about life, and life really must have joy. It's supposed to be fun. One of the reasons I made the most important decision of my life to marry George Bush is because he made me laugh. It's true, sometimes we laugh through our tears, but that shared laughter has been one of our strongest bonds. Find the joy in life, because as Ferris Bueller said on his day off, <laughs> life moves pretty fast, and you don't stop and look around once in a while, you're gonna miss it. I'm not going to tell George you clap more for Ferris than you clap for George. <laughs> Stop there and go. Uh, but you can see how wonderful that speech was. Digitized collections. I'm going to go through this because this is your meat and potatoes. The library has uh, 2020 digitized all 23 presidential paper collections, which are available online. They have varying materials of first ladies, but they do have first ladies materials embedded often as a separate series. Massachusetts Historical Society, which Miriam will be talking about, I can't say enough good things about them. 
Abigail Adams is very fulsome. Louisa Adams is becoming more fulsome and they're just wonderful. And then they're in the Adams Papers Digital Edition. Dolly Madison's Digital Edition has just been published by the University of Virginia and your schools have to uh, buy it. It's, it's not open to the public. The Eleanor Roosevelt uh, Papers Project is digitized by George Washington University. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Has broadcast series, uh, papers, excellent essays. And then a website, which Claudia is going to be talking to us about, Discover LBJ has digitized a large amount of material on Mrs. Johnson. It is run by the LBJ Foundation. Presidential records that are opened under FOIA requests have been digitized for Hillary Clinton because unlike most first ladies, a FOIA request came in immediately for her health care records. So they are on a website, which I have given you the William J. Clinton presidential site. Please look in the more recent first ladies at White House websites. They have a lot of good information. The links are dead. But for example, for Hillary Clinton, you can find all her speeches for Laura Bush, Michelle Obama, some of their speeches, but you can find material right away with those not having to wait for the five years. And in January of 2021, the National Archives made Trump websites, including those of Melania available. And so there's a bunch of Melania Be Best campaign and FLOTUS available already on the NARA Trump Presidential Library website. And then please go to the websites of the presidential libraries and museums, which have very various amounts of materials digitized. So having run a little long, which I apologize because I had uh, been very clear with the panelists for 15 minutes, not too long, but 15 minutes, I'm now uh, happily turning to uh, Miriam. Black and brown, which is rude to watch in front of the camera. <laughs> I'm expediting <laughs> the musical chairs that we're playing. That's all right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really great. There's like a clock right there. That would be very helpful. <laughs> um, so I first want to thank Flair for inviting me to join this panel and to ADE for um, such a warm welcome for my first time here. Um, so really, thank you. Um, and today, I'm lucky enough to not talk about one first lady, but two. Um, and that's Abigail and uh, Louisa Catherine Adams. Um, and so I'm going to first um, give a brief overview of our uh, digital collections and what we have available on at our Adams Papers Digital Edition. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the writings uh, in particular of Louisa Catherine and Abigail. So maybe many of you have already used this awesome website, but if not, I'm gonna give a very brief tour um, because um, maybe you're like me and can get easily lost in this website. Um, if you just go on the browse function, you can end up in many rabbit holes, um, but there is this also this really great search function. So um, I'm first gonna show that in our browse page, you can search by names, by date, volume contents. So we have all of our, um, editions that are online, which the only exceptions to that are the most recent editions. Um, and you can go into each of them. Let's see if my cat, my, my scrolling skills are as good as Catherine's. Um, and 
can scroll down and a brief overview of the Adams Papers. So the Adams Papers project was founded in 1954, right, and covers the writings of three generations um, of this prominent family. Um, and it's primarily divided into three series, um, which we can see here. Um, we have the diaries, we have Adams Family Correspondence, um, and we have the papers of John Adams. Um, and today I'm really going to focus on um, Adams Family Correspondence because those are the series that highlight the voices of Abigail and Louisa Catherine. Um, these are the series where um, right, the women's voices come out most prominently. It's where their letters appear. And volumes uh, 12, 13, and 14 cover Abigail's um, time as first lady. Um, we are not quite yet up to Louisa Catherine's tenure in that position. And while it's so important, and I think the last um, uh, three years have really taught us that digital collections are so important, but so are digital editions and the skills that we as documentary editors um, can bring to help contextualize um, these sources for researchers and a wider audience. And so as someone who was trained in early American history and in women's and gender history, one of the caps that I have thought about in particular, one of the caps I put on were lenses. I feel like I wear multiple lenses, right? When I'm studying these things um, is what does accessibility look like when you're working with women's uh, political uh, writings, right? What did it look like to write a letter as a politically active elite woman in the early United States? Um, because it's been argued um, that, uh, right, it used to be believed by some historians that right, letters right, of, of politicians from this period and patriots of this period were these unfettered streams of consciousness, just everything put to page. Um, but it's been shown by historians actually that, right, and we see this with the Adamses, right? They've drafted letters, they use ciphers, they were thinking about what they were writing. Um, and I would argue the women were doing the same. And not only were they thinking about what they're putting to the page, but they're also thinking about what they can and cannot write as a woman in the early Republic. And so one of the things um, that I really rely on is right, the concepts of, uh, by early women's historians of Republican motherhood, right? The idea that um, women in this new United States were, right, their main contribution was to educate the future, uh, you know, young men of, of the nation, right, to become good active citizens, um, as well as um, performing some of their more political activities that maybe they couldn't do as directly as their spouses, like patronage, like um, using uh, more feminine or more um, domestic uh, examples to sandwich some of their more juicy political information. And both Abigail and Louisa Catherine knew these skills as first ladies, but I would argue that their time as first ladies was actually a culmination of a much longer career. Um, they were politically active long before, right? They, they um, served as first ladies. So one of my favorite examples is um, during, during Abigail's, Abigail Adams' time as first lady, it's right during the XYZ affair, quasi war, things are really heating up. Um, and she writes a, a letter to her sister and she talks about how public opinion is changing fast, Things are turning against France in the United States. Um, you know, the merchants are upset. Um, you know, they're they're getting ready to like send an address to John Adams to, you know, to put this opinion forward. And when you look at the letter, there's this like really juicy paragraph about, but you know what it's sandwiched between? Oh, I just received letters from my son, who's abroad right now, and all the gossip about family back home in Quincy. And this was a skill that right, she used to hide some of that politicking, um, but she also had perfected that skill when she was abroad in the 1780s. And she went to Europe in the 1780s 
Um, when John Adams was um, commissioned uh, by the US government to help negotiate the Treaty of Paris. And then when they went to the court of St. James um, and when John served as the first US um, minister there. And I'm just gonna provide a couple of examples because there's a whole bunch, they were there for quite a few years, um, but she knew what she was doing, right? She wrote to her sister, quote, I could write you an account every week of what I dare say would amuse you, but I fear to take my pen, lest I should give it a scope that would be very improper for the public character with which I am connected and the country where I reside. So she's self-censoring, she's editing. Um, she knows that her letters might not just be read by the recipient, but by family back home, and by the censors in the foreign lands that she was living in. So she needed to think about, okay, how far down the page can I include some information and how can I hide it from potentially censors getting wind of it? And then, you know, newspapers. And so this was a performance, right? Where she played on her femininity. She played on her position. She played on her knowledge. She did this with family. Um, John Thaxter, their cousin, um, who had served as John Adams' secretary abroad, um, wrote to her at one point, I expected politics in your letter. Like, why, why are you holding out this information for me? <laughs> and she says, do you expect any politics from me? Um, <laughs> right, and then he was like, "Your your reproofs are always accompanied with so much delicacy that the reproof forget the censor in their friend." <laughs> so she's playing with her audience. She knows what is happening, and one of the things, right, that I keep in mind um, is how do we provide our readers with the the historical methods to learn what's happening in these larger letters as we're building annotation. Um, and so interestingly, whereas Abigail was very forward with what she was doing in her letters and was quite aware of how she was playing with her reader um, and very much censored what she was writing, and we actually see a, a bit of a different approach from Louisa Catherine um, in, the, in the time around the Missouri crisis. Um, so Louisa Catherine Adams had returned to the United States to Washington DC in 1817 after having been abroad in Europe for quite a few years um, where her husband was serving as the US minister to uh, Russia. Um, and then there was a brief stint in Paris and in London. Um, and then they made their way to Washington DC where John Quincy um, was uh, appointed secretary of state seen as the stepping stone in the period to the presidency. Um, so they're just like eyes on the prize, right? We're so close to the presidency. Um, and then the Missouri crisis happens. And so the Missouri crisis was um, a moment in which Missouri wanted to enter the United States, um, but uh, they would be entering as a slave state, which would upset the balance of um, uh, free and slave states in the United States and had the potential um, right to uh, really, really stir up issues. It's like there was, um, it was like a fire bell in the night, I think Jefferson called it or something. Um, and uh, Louisa realized she's like, okay, I can't really say what I'm thinking. But what she actually starts to do when she's in Washington is she was writing um, letters to Abigail Adams um, that were really like journal entries in which she was really talking about what it was like to be part of, you know, this new etiquette that had been developed in Washington, D.C. Um, and after Abigail um, dies, John actually asks her to send them to him. And in these um, uh, in these letters, which were really composed like uh, journals, she talks about her thoughts on Missouri and um, you know, this really developing um, and progressing anti-slavery opinion. But she uses these letters and to be really open because when she's in Washington society, she can't. She constantly spoke about how she'd be on the floor of Congress watching from the galleries and everyone was looking at her face to see what her husband thought on the, on the matter. So she used to have like the ultimate poker face. Um, and there's this great quote, I wanna, I wanna get it. So 
So um, she wrote, she described it as she needed to have quote much discretion and discernment, and it quote became very difficult to avoid irritating enmity without an appearance of fawning and intrigue, which is despicable to the soul of a proud and virtuous woman to endeavor to conciliate those whose good opinion it is while to secure. Um, and she right, she takes a very different approach from um, from her mother in law, and both of these approaches are within a really short period of time, but they show the different ways that politically active elite women use their letters, right, to do their politicking, to develop political opinions, to inform their husband's politics. Um, and thinking about, right, these larger trends and patterns, right, when we um, go and annotate their letters is, I think, something that's really important to accessibility because it opens, um, it opens this larger conversation and interdisciplinarity between our field and others. Thank you. Claudia Anderson is gonna be next. So we're going to do our musical chairs again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Miriam, you can. Oh, okay. Is Mark here for this guy? Mark is Mark to find mine. I'm going to try and help as Mark. Would it be the PowerPoint right there? Yeah. Yeah. Here comes. Here. Oh, yes. you I will say as Mark is working that Abigail wrote this great letter to John Adams, which I'm sure Miriam is very familiar with, where she said she, when she first became first lady that she was afraid she was too outspoken and she didn't know how she was going to be first lady and deal with being outspoken. <laughs> Claudia? Okay. <clears throat> lady Bird Johnson was thrust into the role of First Lady when Lyndon Johnson assumed the presidency on November 22, 1963, following, following the assassination of his predecessor, President John Kennedy. Soon afterwards, Mrs. Johnson uh, told a close friend that she was considering keeping a diary. Uh, the close friend, Liz Carpenter, encouraged her to do that, and uh, Mrs. Johnson borrowed a battery-operated tape recorder from Liz Carpenter's son, Scott. Um, she began then to record her memories of the chaotic day of the assassination, and so began her five-year habit of keeping an audio diary. The Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library located in Austin, Texas has digitized Lady Bird's audio diary and other historical materials providing a window into her White House years. Mrs. Johnson said she began keeping the diary because she realized the unique position as an observer that she had and wanted to preserve history as she saw it. She wanted her children and grandchildren to be able to see history through her eyes. She also hoped that it would make her better organized and better disciplined, and she liked writing. Lady Bird was well prepared for the role of diarist. She had degrees from the University of Texas in both history and journalism, and she had been actively observing the country's political life since well before her husband's election to Congress in 1937. Her diary is full of observations and insights about family life and her efforts to create a comfortable haven for the president in the White House, her beautification campaign and her interest in the environment, her support for Lyndon Johnson's leg legislative agenda, and his struggles with the war in Vietnam. She recorded in a small room off of her bedroom. It was a combination dressing room and office. She did not record every day 
and she often recorded her memories of several days in one sitting. You can see on the picture, uh, there are envelopes stacked against the back of the couch. She would save programs, press releases, her own shorthand notes, and put them in an envelope with the date. She would use those envelopes when she sat down to record her memories for the day. She often missed days due to the demands of her schedule or because she would have days that were just uneventful. At the end of her term, at the end of her term, at the end of her <laughs> husband's term, uh, she left the White House with a suitcase full of tapes, which had been transcribed by White House typists. She edited and published uh, by her estimate about one seventh of the diary as a book, a White House diary. In 1997, she gave the collection of tapes, transcripts, and envelopes to the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library. After the library staff opened the audio tapes and the transcripts, they made it a priority to publish the material on the web. And the transcripts that are on the web are the ones that were typed in the White House, but many of them have been annotated by Mrs. Johnson herself. Her diary began with a description of the motorcade through Dallas. Uh, she describes hearing the shots and the frantic ride to the hospital. She says in a slow cadence, I looked up and saw a sign hospital. Only then did I believe that this might be what it was. Later in the recording, she goes on to describe going in to see Mrs. Kennedy aboard Air Force One. This is after they've all boarded the plane and they're ready to return to Washington. I'm going to play you the uh, segment. Mrs. Kennedy's dress was stained with blood. One leg was almost entirely covered with it. And her right glove was caked that immaculate woman, it was caked with blood, her husband's blood. She always wore gloves like she was used to them. I never could. And that was somehow one of the most poignant sights. Exquisitely dressed and caked in blood. I asked her if I couldn't get somebody to come in to help her change. And she says, oh no, that's all right. Perhaps later I'll ask for Mary Gallagher, but not right now. And then with something, if with a person that gentle, that dignified, you can say had an element of fierceness, she said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. That's one of the more dramatic passages in, uh, in Mrs. Johnson's diary. So complete was her recording for that day that she submitted it to the Warren Commission when she was asked for her statement. As Nancy mentioned, the library maintains a separate website to exhibit archival material from our holdings. And Mrs. Johnson's diary is there. The site is built on an Omeka platform. Omeka is a free, flexible, and open source web publishing platform for the display of library, museum, and archives, and scholarly collections. We chose Omeka because it was free, open source, and enabled us to easily ingest non-standard metadata, including legacy information about our collections. It also gave us searchable uh, uh, capacities that uh, were very flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, people can narrow their searches to collections. However, this has turned out to be a very confusing search engine for our researchers. And we currently have a contractor looking at ways to make the site uh, more intuitive. And I'll just show you, a brief. this is the home page you see here. Um, and when you put in a search term, I've put in um, 1964, September 11th, we recommend this format for dates. It pulls up a number of hits. You see a list along the left side of the page. Uh, 
you can go through that list and make selections and it's an extra filter on the, uh, the hits. This is just a, a micro uh, image of the portion for collections. If you click on Ladybird's uh, White House Diary, you get just two hits. If onto the audio diary, you get a page that shows the transcript as well as a link to the audio. Um, this afternoon, I, I wanna highlight the diary, but I also want to talk about some of the other material that we have uh, digitized that pertains to Mrs. Johnson. I'm going to play a passage from a day that's associated with her, her whistle stop campaign. In October, 1964, Mrs. Johnson made a train trip through the South campaigning for her husband ahead of the presidential election. The whistle stop campaign was partly significant because it was the first time a first lady had made a campaign trip without her husband along. Now, during the summer, President Johnson had supported and signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The act was unpopular in the South and many Southerners felt abandoned by the Democratic administration. Mrs. Johnson's family originated in Alabama and she wanted to go to the South and make it clear that she and her husband cared about and valued that part of the country. On September 11th, 64, she spent time calling Democratic political leaders in the South, asking them if they would ride the train with her. Many were reluctant, um, not wanting to be too closely associated with the administration at that point. Uh, I'm going to play a segment from her diary that day. Uh, she first talks with Senator Strom Thurmond. He was an arch segregationist from South Carolina. Uh, then she goes on to talk uh, about her conversations with Georgia politicians. Um, she talked to Governor Carl Sanders, who was a supporter. She talked with Senator Herman Talbage. He was a segregationist. And she talked to Senator Richard Russell. He was a segregationist, but he was also a very close personal family friend of the Johnsons. Friday, September the 11th, began my planning for the whistle stop trip to the South. I put in calls to the governors of the states that I would travel through and to the senators of those states, most of them. The most hilarious call probably was to Senator Strom Thurmond. Here too, I quickly gave my reasons for the call, that I recognized fully the many differences that divided him and Lyndon ideologically. I knew they were both Democrats, and I would be proud and happy to have him by my side when I went through the state of South Carolina. Senator Thurmond said he had to make a very basic decision within the next two weeks, and though he thanked me very much, he must regret. That sounds interesting, and we'll see. The decision could be either one of several roads, the old road of Dixiecrat, voting the party in some fashion, or the complete severance of going over to the Republicans. And so, here we go marching through Georgia. Not at all to my surprise, the dearest of them all, Dick Russell, said that probably no, he would very likely be traveling but that he would be glad to let us have as advanced men one or if Congress was out, two of the best people from his office. And that the state of Georgia would certainly welcome me courteously and happily. He had advice about where to go. He was interested. I think it very likely that at the last he might even ride the train or come out for us. But his difference with Lyndon on civil rights is that of a man deep, perhaps 10 years older and deeply embedded in the mores of his state. Senator Talmadge said, why, yes, if his schedule permits, he would certainly ride the train with us. Now, that is an elastic and dependable phrase. But he said, Betty for sure would ride it all the way with us. I talked to Mrs. Sanders, and she and Governor Sanders are among our strongest friends on the whole route. We'll be glad to be co-chairman for the state, and we'll ride the train. Just days after this conversation, Senator Strom Thurmond announced that he was switching from the Democratic to the Republican Party. Um, Senators Talmadge and Russell did not board the train. 
But Senator Talmadge's wife, Betty, did ride along. Um, Senator uh, Richard Russell did not have a wife. He was a bachelor, so he didn't have anyone to represent him on the train. And both uh, Governor Carl Sanders and his wife uh, gladly boarded the train and rode along on the whistle stop. The library has digitized um, folders in our collection that deal with the uh, whistle stop as well as material in our photo collection. This is a contact sheet. The White House photographers uh, went along on the trip. They went along on lots of Mrs. Johnson's trips and took wonderful, wonderful photos. The entire uh, contact sheet collection is on our website. You can search it by date and you can use these contact sheets to order images uh, from the library. Most of these images, these that I'm showing, have already been digitized, so it's an easy matter to get them from the library uh, using the, the digitized contact sheets. We've digitized folders of material on the whistle stop. Um, the first item here is a press release of a speech. Uh, not only do we have speeches from the whistle stop, we have Mrs. Johnson's speeches from the entire uh, administration. And it's a wonderful collection. It's the text of the speeches, not the audio. Uh, here's a news release. Um, an interesting piece of memorabilia is the luncheon menu from the, uh, from the train. You notice right in the middle, uh, it says LBJ special Perdinalis River Chili. That was an old family recipe from the Donsons. <laughs> um, we have schedules. This last item is from Mrs. Johnson's daily diary. Apart from the audio diary and the transcripts that she kept, uh, a secretary helped keep a daily diary for her that lists her activities. And so we have these daily diaries even for days where she did not uh, record. In addition, whoops. I didn't explain the contact sheets very well. A contact sheet is a, a photo page with all the images from a roll of film, and for those of you who aren't familiar with them. So you can look at the whole roll of film and then order a picture. In addition, we have oral history interviews with Mrs. Johnson. We have the transcripts of the oral histories. Uh, there are 45 interviews. The interviews focus on uh, the years before they went to the White House because the interviewers felt like we had the, um, the White House diary for the White House years. Uh, there is an exception to that. Nancy Smith, our uh, moderator, did an interview with Mrs. Johnson in uh, 1987 and it discusses her role as First Lady. And it's a very interesting interview. These pictures are just representative of some of the topics that she talks about, um, her, her childhood, her youth, uh, her Aunt Effie, uh, down in the corner, you see a picture of a woman. Uh, Mrs. Johnson's mother died when she was very young and Aunt Effie helped raise her. Um, the oral histories also talk about Lyndon Johnson's years in the House and in the Senate. Um, the, uh, the picture up here in the corner is Mrs. Johnson at their, uh, radio station, TV station in Austin, Texas, KTBC. Uh, she had a large hand in managing uh, the business there and was quite a businesswoman. We also have a collection of letters that um, the president and Mrs. Johnson sent to each other, including their, uh, we call them courtship letters, their love letters. They had a, a short courtship, it was about 10 weeks but they wrote almost every day. So it's a wonderful collection of letters. It uh, shows a woman uh, very interested in the environment already and a young man very interested in politics. Um, the last thing I would like to mention, uh, well, these are uh, the pictures they exchanged. They're mentioned in that previous letter you saw the highlighted portions uh, and their honeymoon picture. The last thing I'd like to mention, um, in the late 1930s, uh, LBJ gave Mrs. Johnson a, uh, a movie camera and she began making movies. And in the high, White House years, she took those movies, put them together and added commentary. Those are available on YouTube. 
uh, they're wonderful. They uh, cover uh, her husband's campaigns, their daughter's birthday parties, <laughs> all kinds of things, uh, life in Washington, DC, uh, life on the ranch. And I highly recommend them. Lady Bird Johnson left historians a wealth of documentation on the important role of a first modern first lady. I encourage you to visit Discover LBJ and discover what's there. Now, while we're doing the uh, musical chairs, I just wanted to say, wow, uh, Lyndon Johnson's love letters were full of politics. Mrs. Johnson said back to him, Lyndon, I don't know what the deal is, but I hope it's not politics. <laughs> and it's very similar to what Michelle Obama said to Barack Obama when he said he was going to run for Illinois Senate. And she said, boy, I thought you were bright. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a certain commonality among many first ladies about the political world. I think Katie's ready. And so we have a wonderful presentation lined up from Katie. Well, these are all hard acts to follow here. This has been wonderful so far. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, getting us to this point in the program. And I certainly hope to have time for your questions. We all would welcome that. What kind of challenges? for writing history are presented by digitization. What kinds of opportunities? As this paper will suggest, there clearly are both. I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it, by now in this conference. Offerings would be far more meager without the access to digital records we have now. In fact, there are so many reasons to love digital records, but there are challenges as well. As I have learned in my research on Michelle Obama, the landscape is a lot different than it was when I worked on Florence Harding 15 years ago. Florence had a tangible paper record, letters, microfilms, checks, newspaper articles. And these were evidence, for example, of her interest in voting for her husband and encouraging other women to vote, her activism on behalf of veterans, women prisoners, and others, her presence in newspapers. And all of it I found on paper, mm -hmm. on microfilm, on various archives from Marion, Ohio to Washington, DC. And then toward the end of preparing my manuscript, my editor, Lou Gould, was increasingly sending me links to old things, odd things popping up on eBay. By the way, you can get this letter for $1,800 if you'd like. <laughs> I wasn't really finding most of my material through digital archives though, but more and more, I was finding digitization was enhancing my work, such as discovering what Florence's favorite song was. Okay, now let's see if I can make this work. Hopefully, again. Oh, no, it did that again. Darn it. Oh, oh, well, you know what? You'll have to wait for her song. Oh, maybe. Hang on. I'll go back and try again. I have to go real quick, right? Oh, <laughs> Let's <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go to minute fifty because you can zip ahead. While okay, there. you just have to. I just got to come back here. Let me do a screen share. I'm just gonna make sure I can do that. Okay, you move that. So Florence brought entertainers to the White House, and one of her favorites was a woman called Harriet Dickens Bond, um, who was a singer-songwriter of her era, and she wrote the song called A Perfect Day. I just want to play you a slice of it because it confirms the help, the wonderful, the wonderful assists provided by digital um, archives. Okay, that's just moment 21, so let me see if I can get to moment 50, sorry. No. Wow. Okay, oh, sorry. That's enough, we want <laughs> Without digitized records, one, one could not listen to such wonderful things. <laughs> Anything else I need to do? Oh, it's it's hanging out there and people are gonna yes oh so here sorry when you screen share i think it'd be easier if we like 
multiple key share sites. Okay, we'll just leave this up here, and when you're ready, you press new share. New share. Okay. And you go back to new. Okay, I have to call for your help, but I'll. I'll call. So they're all. Oh, okay. But I'm done with that slide. So can I go to this one? Yes. Okay. But I have to press new share. Okay. And oh, oh, sorry. Okay. And um, oh, well, actually, it's on this. Yes, it's on this. Do you know where it went? Is it this one? Okay. Sorry. That, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. okay, so this is really cool because this is actually, I just learned um, from Connie, thank you, that uh, we have the uh, South, University of South Carolina to thank for a wonderful collection of movie tone films. So this is from 1922 when Florence was welcoming women who were uh, the wives of Filipino independence activists to the White House. And it was also a moment of a photo op for her. And this was something that Florence was extremely good at. So you can see there she is in the middle. I think you recognize her as the um, non-Filipino you know, woman in the crowd, uh, and she's welcoming them. And it was a lovely afternoon. A lot of pictures were taken by Movie Town News. So thanks, kind of fun. So obviously digital history allows one to gather wonderful pictures, wonderful videos, wonderful music, right? Native American chiefs visiting the White House, uh, Albert, Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, who would think that Albert Einstein would have anything to do with the Hardings, but there it is, um, Marie Curie, and even videos from Alaska. Now I'm gonna see if I can do this right, thank you. Uh, new share. Um, mm. Oh, this, right? Oh, oh, do. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get out of here again. Or, I, oh gosh. Um, okay. X out. Okay. It was a lot easier before. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Here it is. Ah, share. great. It works. Oh, but now I got to share. New share. Yes. Okay. And now, I think, maybe. In 1923, President Warren G. Harding and First Lady Florence are on their way to Alaska. The only surviving footage shows the president being received with great pomp and ceremony. But once he gets to Alaska, everything is far more relaxed. He's here to open the brand new Alaska Railroad. Starting in Seward, they set off on the 470 mile journey north. Well, you get the idea, right? So it's a lot of fun and you can look this up yourself You Google Smithsonian, Harding, uh, Alaska trip. It's great, it's a lot of fun. So um, now I'm gonna go back and just go to the next uh, slide. Yes, so what I wanted to mention that clearly, right? Oh, I have to new share again, sorry. New share. And then now I'm going here. Oh, I got it now, see? Just takes me a few times, okay. So anyway, most, okay. So what I wanted to mention here was that obviously digitized photos, videos were a huge asset, um, loads of treasures online, right? Wonderful stuff. So I was benefiting. I was benefiting from these, uh, some, even as the book was finished uh, and even after, and of course I've talked about Florence ad nauseum for years since the book came out in 2009. <laughs> so more and more of these digitized records have just added. And you're like, wait a minute, aren't you supposed to be talking about a modern first lady? Don't worry, I'll get there. Um, so, so much was available about Florence then, um, but there were some things that were not. Aha, you are seeing them here. Yes, you see her husband, as you may know, had a mistress or perhaps more than one. In fact, we now know he definitely had another because there was a child who's now 67. Um, that was the grandson actually. But in any case, there is a connection, sadly, um, that Florence, not for the young man, of course, but sadly that I, in, in fact, did not know of the second mistress or I refused to believe it, but there it was. I did know about this one though, but however, her letters were hidden. This is Carrie Phillips um, and nobody could 
didn't see them until 2014. Oh. However, I found a way to see them because out in Wyoming, there is the American Heritage Center. And there, Francis Russell, um, not Richard Russell, but Francis Russell, uh, had deposited papers from his book, The Shadow of Blooming Grove. And so I was able to get the ellipted, is that a word, uh, excerpts from his book, which his publisher at the time would not put out in 1968. And these were, of course, the juicy love letters. And now you can see them yourself if you like. So again, <laughs> they were in paper when I was doing the book, right? They, were, they came from this arc. But now, of course, everything is online and available at the Library of Congress. Okay, so Michelle Obama, more than a century younger than Florence, has a much greater digital footprint. And in the interest of time and saving time for questions, I'm not going to play these for you. They're just simply links, right, to the um, what is called the uh, sort of frozen in time website. I think this was alluded to already by Nancy, yeah. that the modern first ladies have these websites. Very, very nice um, to uh, look at. Now, with Florence, whether digitized or not, you didn't have to worry about the current way of getting materials, which um, Nancy's also alluded to already, filing Freedom of Information Act requests. These had not yet been invented, of course, in the 1920s. So you can, um, with more recent first ladies, though, like Michelle Obama, this is the way you get information about them. Now, some of them have already been made available, but not uh, not most of them, of course, with more the more recent first ladies are not available. As an archivist, David Langbart once uh, has told me recently, FOIA is just about the only way to get materials, and of course, you have said this yourself, um, uh, out of any of the more recent presidential administrations and presidential libraries. The days when the collections were systematically reviewed are over. He adds materials on first ladies, which were largely unclassified in the past, except for Carrie Phillips. Well, she wasn't a first lady. Let's not talk about her or leave her in the past. <laughs> um, and thus faster to uh, open up are now classified or otherwise restricted as they get into more policy related areas. Yes, it's true. And of course, this is exactly what Jill Hummer, another first lady historian who's writing a book about Laura Bush, has also discovered uh, when she was completing her book. I submitted my FOIA request back in November 2019, she shared. These are replies to some of my uh, status updates uh, that she asked for. She asked for them in February, 2022, and she could see that nothing had really changed. February to December, it was still the same amount of time for this amount of information, yeah. right? Pretty discouraging. You'll notice, oh, Nancy's checking to see if this is accurate. Uh, <laughs> you'll notice that these, these time estimates didn't change at all between February and December, mm -hmm. okay. And so 21 months had stretched into really 31 at least, but then she goes on to share with the others, it was far, far longer. Do we see 12 years? Yes, wow. uh-huh, oh right, 20, yes. And again, October, <laughs> February, December, okay. She adds, you'll see, you'll see where some would take me more than two decades. That's when I gave up on the FOIAs. Oh. Now, just like Dr. Hummer, I feel that my story may well be the same, 20 years, right? 20 years. But thankfully, uh, Nancy Smith here is informing me that if I can be a little more strategic in my requests and not just ask for all the information about uh, Michelle Obama's work on, for instance, some of the things that you may have just noticed on this previous slide, um, her work on Let's Move, her work on Joining Forces, which was the military, Let's Move was with the children and the obesity and all that, the Let Girls Learn, that maybe I can be strategic and ask maybe for something more specific or in time period uh, narrowing there, I might be able to get more. But at least you can say I have not been forgotten. I just got this from the, uh, just last month, from the uh, George Bush Library. Um, since it has been some time since your FOIA request was submitted, we're contacting you to determine if you're still interested. Of course, I'm still interested. Um, so what you can see, though, is, is I had to publish my book without these materials. Um, however, it would still be interesting. And by the way, I did get some very good materials on Laura Bush because other people had filed FOIAs, and they had filed specific FOIAs, like on her trips to Liberia. So I was able to bring that into my book on Southern First Ladies and point out her activism there, which was so interesting. Um, to bring into the story. Okay, so recent First Ladies documents then, many of which were born digital, are only declassified on demand, which does not sound bad on its face, except that it seems to mean extensive delays in getting material. As a result, the way we do history will and has already changed. 
unlike with Florence, where the papers have been born on paper and really never classified, oh, except for Carrie Phillips. We now <laughs> must wait decades for many of the most innocuous items. Now, we can't just blame digitization for this. It's not really the reason. It's really more about these presidential record acts, the records acts that we've been learning about. Indeed, one could argue that digitization, pictures, websites, scanned documents, videos, has made so much more immediately available that this must weigh against a very long delay for some of those behind the scenes materials. One can work without them. And of course, there are as well the previous FOIAs, as I've suggested, that others have gotten done already that I can use. Um, to give you one example, when I was writing the Southern First Lady's book, as you saw, I was able to use that collection not only on her trip to Liberia, um, but to India as well to talk about Laura Bush's work in health and education. This was hugely helpful um, to get more press releases, but I will still have to wait quite a while um, for Michelle Obama. Now, I would like to try to click on this. So I'm gonna try. Now I'm gonna go like this, and then I need to, I think, oh, now that works, right? Now, but I have to do a new share. Is that right, a new share? Okay, new share. And then I go back, I got it now, okay. And now it will share, and you can see, these are some of the um, information. Oh, except I've got to scroll, let's see. We have some good scrollers in this room. So what you can see, these are some of the things that have released. Isn't this interesting? Look, you can find photographs of Beyonce Knowles. Look at that. Okay. So if I can just sort of strategize a little bit, as you say, I can get some pictures and many are already available. Okay, now I'm going to go back. And that means I have to, no, wait, hold on. I can go back here, but I have to do something else, right? No, okay, no, they can't see it. I didn't do a new share again. Yeah. Yeah, new share. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. So, so this is the um, this is the again uh, just a little mention about all the good things that are now available um, on the Obama White House site, which you alluded to as well, and the other uh, pre more recent First Lady sites. And you see they're called frozen in time, but I just had to show you, of course, another picture of the Hardings, um, and they too are frozen in time. But look at that foot, that foot of Calvin. I'm a little worried that doesn't bode well, and it didn't because you know what happened. You know what happened to them in the White House. I'm sure um, the Hardings did not survive that trip to Alaska you saw, that was really the end of it for them. They thought that she was going to die on that trip, but actually he did, as you may know. And in just a few weeks, on August 2nd, it will be the 100th anniversary of the death of Warren G. Hardy. <laughs> anyway, um, so there you have it. Now, all in all, this digital immediacy provides much, despite the FOIA lags. As Jill Humbers also pointed out, there are so many excellent materials that are available digitally, not only the images, but also the documents, the speeches, the press releases, like that White House Frozen in Time website. There, for, in for instance, Dr. Hummer pointed out, she found all of Mrs. Bush's speeches and press releases and the president's organized by date. It's wonderful. But as she notes, this does not give you any insight into what was going on behind the scenes, right? You don't get the memoranda, the reports circulated internally and all the colorful stuff. Yet you do get, hold on, I'm going to do this now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the new, I, I think I'm gonna go to the new share, right? I'm gonna go to the new share. I'm gonna bring this up and I'm gonna share it. Oh, but I didn't start the video yet. Oh, I have to close this. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you this. This shows you all the C-SPAN videos. Oh, no, it's Beyonce again. Oh, well, forget that. Um, <laughs> sure. uh, we'll, co we'll come back. Don't worry. Oh, no, we're totally bollocks now. Um, oh, oh. Wait, where do I, how do I get back to Michelle? Oh, thank you. Sorry. I actually don't worry about that one. I want to show them the, a couple of these clips. Sorry. And let me just hide this quickly. Wow, wow. Michelle Obama online, but no, just those four things something. you're going to have to wait for and maybe be strategic <laughs> about. But let us stop now. Do you think, um, uh, Chair, Madam Chair, shall we stop so we have time for questions? I think we should stop. I'd like to just make a couple of comments on Katie's uh, excellent presentation, but having had it up access, I just want to clarify for everyone that the first lady's paper not a declassification process they're going through you for the restrictions that I was telling you clearly unwarranted privacy. 
statutory material, and sometimes they will have and the problem that you need to address is like, for example, in Bush and in George W. Bush and in Trump, the, just the electronic systems that had been digitized came in at 250 terabytes. So there's no way with the archives having increasingly smaller staffs and doing a review on a page-by-page -page basis that you can get to the stuff. So 